Thank you. When Cece asked me last, at the end of last year if I would be interested in giving the last lecture, that word last kind of gave me pause. In fact, it gave me plenty to think about. I decided to deflect, is it, sorry, can you hear me? Is it all right? I decided to deflect the thought that she might be saying something incredibly dire about my teaching career. I decided to deflect the thought that she might be saying something dire about my age. And then I decided to deflect the thought that she might be saying something dire about my future prospects on the planet. <laughs> in fact, I decided to suppress the suspicion that she was in, this was an incredibly gracious way of saying to a professor who had maybe lingered a little long, you know, that it's time to go and we'll give you one last show. I had this image of the students in the Americans for Informed Democracy at Boston College sitting in a back room saying, let's see, who gets the nudge next? <laughs> so somewhat daunted by that, I accepted the invitation. And then my colleagues got wind of it. Their reaction was totally different. Their reaction was, don't worry about the last lecture. Since you're not retiring, you can recover. <laughs> uh, recover? Uh, recover from what exactly? And they just, they just went on and said um, what they thought would be the prospects of my ultimate words of wisdom. I can recover. But seriously though, um, despite these rather scary intimations of what the last lecture might mean, I am incredibly honored to be here. And I'm grateful to the Americans for informed democracy at Boston College for giving me this opportunity. Think about it for a minute. What would you say if you were asked to give one final lecture that sums up whatever you think is most important to talk about? After I got over the shock of the sort of enormity of the situation and the enormity of the challenge, I really loved thinking about it and thinking about what mattered the most and what I could compress into a, a, a short talk about what is very dear to my heart. So I'm generally, genuinely honored to be here and very grateful for this opportunity. And I'm thank, I thank the students very much for that. And it should be said, even about my skeptical colleagues, that they were on to something very important. Um, and, and this is by way of introduction to what I was talking about, they, what, what I want to talk about. They were referring to one of the best things about teaching when they said I could recover. If at first you don't succeed, you get another shot. You can try again. In most cases, you don't have to get it into a last lecture. Teaching isn't like that. It's ongoing. It's a conversation. It's a dialogue. And this idea is related to what I'd like to talk about today. Genuine communication involves the need to keep trying. In this sense, there can be no last lecture, only an attempt. I'll try to explain. Last spring, two weeks before the end of the semester, my husband of nearly 40 years died suddenly with no warning. I'm not gonna talk today about grief, which is entirely bound up with what is private, with particular memories and individual pain. But I would like to talk about something that was brought home to me in a new way by the experience of loss, which is the curious fact that grief is virtually a universal experience, and yet it's intensely private. And what bridges that gap between the soul's profound solitude on the one hand and the human community on the other? That's the question I want to explore. I returned to teaching about a week after my husband died. My colleagues had offered to take my place in the classroom, but something propelled me back to school. Actually, it felt like an oasis, a place of healing. I've always drawn a lot of energy and happiness from my students. By then, I had received countless messages and and letters from acquaintances and friends, including my students, many of whom wrote 
saying that they didn't know what to say, that words couldn't express what they wanted to say or what they imagined I was feeling. And that was true. This was an experience that utterly eluded language, not just that of my students who did not know my husband, but even that of many friends who did know him and knew him well. Some of them in their letters to me were able to beautifully capture aspects of his being, but no one could capture what it is to experience such a loss. No one, least of all I, could express what I felt or what I felt I'd lost. No one could go back through the layers of memories overlaid with feeling and now overlaid with new feelings that constitute my inner life. To this day, I can't imagine being able to express a fraction of what this interior landscape is like, this long chapter of a life, family, intimacy, everydayness, all there but locked away in memory, invisible to the world, and infused with an indefinable emotional tenor. It's a universe of the unsayable, much of it closed to others. And each of you has your own hidden, inarticulate world. The day I returned to the classroom, I emailed my students, thanking them for their messages and the beautiful plants that they had send, sent, but asking them to please let me hold a normal class. So we did. I, I was, to be truthful, afraid I couldn't get through the material without this air of normality, without their behaving as if nothing had happened. And to this day, I'm grateful to them for their cooperation and pretending. At the end of the class, I was able to thank them and to say one thing that I had learned in that previous week, which is that language, even in its stammering imprecision, is absolutely indispensable to comfort and healing. It was at the end of that class that Cece asked if I would be interested in giving the last lecture, and I knew then that that's what I wanted to talk about. If you think about it, what else do we have to string over the abyss between what is universal, the experience of loss, and what is individual and constituted by unique emotional resonance? It is words, because they do string out bridges over the abyss. Sometimes, maybe often, they're not up to the task, but they bind us together nonetheless. They lay, lie at the basis of human solidarity, at the basis of the literary arts. They are, in fact, an essential link between community, love, and art. They are what allows us, however inadequately, to break down the walls of sil solitude, to reach out our arms to one another. When I talk about words, then, I will talking about, I'll be talking about the medium that I know best, but I hope it will be clear that words are meant to stand in here for all forms of human communication, especially in the arts. By way of illustrating the treasure that language represents, in spite of, or maybe because of its inadequacies, I'd like to offer a couple of personal examples. Afterwards, I'll try to make a connection between those examples and broader concerns, both in literature and in life. Let me begin with some words of consolation that people offered me when my husband died. I think they'll illustrate how words can help, even when you least expect it, even when you think they might, they glance off the mark completely. Last fall, a quirky, fun-loving, terrific former student came back to BC many years after graduation, and she stopped in to see me. She asked me how I was doing, and I explained to her that my husband had died, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm having trouble figuring out who I am after so long as being part of a couple. She didn't skip a beat. She said, you probably know this, but when a caterpillar changes into a butterfly, the eyes don't stay the same, the head doesn't stay the same, and the tail doesn't stay the same. They just dissolve into a soup. That was her only comment. So I was, so I was molting. Um, I didn't really feel like a caterpillar. <laughs> In fact, I think you could say that I have no natural affinity for caterpillars. <laughs> and I certainly didn't feel like a butterfly. <laughs> 
But the real point is it doesn't matter. She made me laugh. She still makes me laugh. And I kind of find it consoling to think of myself dissolving into caterpillar soup. <laughs> then, later in the same conversation, this student, this former student, she's now about 40, told me that she herself had an action plan for grief. Grief, in her case, was for a former boyfriend. They had broken up. And she said, you know, I was lying on, on the floor in despair, you know, the way you do, and I was eating mangoes and, and, and eating chocolate and drinking red wine, and I thought, I can do this. I can do this. I will do 40 days of this. I will do 40 days of mangoes, 40 days of chocolate, 40 days of red wine, <clears throat> and then I will do 40 days of yoga practice, 40 days of photographing thing, different things that I love in the world, and maybe 40 days of sex. And then I'll be cured. I can do this. <laughs> well, I did go out and buy some mangoes. <laughs> I'm not at all sure that the rest was going to apply. But I love the idea that she had a plan, that there were people out there with plans, and there were things you could do. The night after I saw her, I woke up laughing in the middle of the night. And, I thought of, and the thought of her 40-day regimen still makes me laugh. And it makes me feel just a little bit more certain that life will go on and lots of it will be good. These last two examples didn't have much to do with what I was feeling at the time. And that's exactly the point. They did not express my own experience. Instead, they reminded me that, in the words of the player king in Hamlet, grief joys, joy grieves on slender accident. As such, they strung out a little footbridge across the abyss of my loneliness and offered me a glimpse back to the joy part of the equation. The next example is very different. I was taking a walk with a friend, and she was trying to imagine what I was going through. And she re recalled a poem that she had read. She couldn't even remember the name of the poet. And in the poem, he said that coming upon his, a photograph of his dead wife, unprepared, was like coming upon a severed hand. For months after she told me that, I couldn't get it out of my mind. Coming upon one of my husband's hats or a pair of his shoes or his idiosyncratic collection of oddments felt exactly like coming upon a severed hand. I can't begin to tell you why such a terrible image was consoling to me, but it's true. Its very brutality is what was strangely comforting. This poet, maybe 50 years ago, must have experienced some particle of what I feel, of what I felt. It can't be the same, of course. Wrong period, wrong ghost of memory, wrong gender, and all of that. It doesn't matter. A severed hand reaches across the infinite distance between us, I don't even know the name of this poet, and keeps me feeling part of the human family, and thus not alone. What counts, then, is the attempt to say something, to reach across the gulf between people. It's interesting to me that some of the grimmest or most off-the-wall things people said to me in the months following my husband's death helped me the most. I was consoled by what was unconsoling, or way off the mark. This paradox is what I want to think about here. How is it that something one person says or writes can be completely disjunctive, hilariously out of left field, or freighted with untranslatable meaning and still strike a match in the soul of another. In my own research, I have long been fascinated with hybrid zones, with in-between places, with thresholds, and this is one of them. Maybe language is like a hybrid, is a hybrid zone itself, a sort of tre treacherous threshold where you have to step from one very different surface to another and pray you reach the other side. Maybe we're all speaking foreign languages and grasping at translation to understand each other's vernacular. And maybe, as Walter Benjamin wrote in his essay, The Task of the Translator, the translator must expand and deepen his language by means of the foreign language. 
It becomes an extending process, a widening and a deepening, this business of communication, though with a portion of untranslatability always built in. I'd like to say now, make a, a transition to talk a little bit about literature and the same, the same lesson, which is that language, even when it seems to miss the mark, can extend meaning and bring us closer together. Uh, I'd like to use a couple of examples. The first is from Hamlet, which is certainly a play in which language plays a starring role. Throughout most of the doings at Elsinore, words are treated as a kind of shadow play, as a veil shrouding thoughts or misleading people, rather than as thoughts expression. They cause confusion. They deflect suspicion. Hamlet is, after all, pretending to be mad to seek the truth. Then he devises a play to find out whether the king killed his father. It's not truth that is eventually effective in catching the culprit, but theatrical pretense that leads to truth. In other words, it's a masquerade, a form of trickery that holds, as Hamlet puts it, a mirror up to nature. Language becomes in Hamlet a kind of costume of its own that can both hide and reveal the truth. Its double entendres, its very ambiguities, both obscure and expand meaning, ironically, in either case, exposing hidden realities. Even so, something is always lost in translation. When Ophelia goes mad, her words are described this way. Quote, her speech is nothing, yet the unshaped use of it doth move the hearers to collection. They aim at it and botch the words up fit to their own thoughts. In other words, someone's words may be nothing, or they may be full of substance, but in either case, we botch the words up to fit our own thoughts. We mangle the translation for reasons of our own. The graveyard scene in Hamlet explores yet another problem with language. There, the way words can elude meaning is explicitly tied to my subject here, which is the gap between the universal and the individual. Hamlet comes upon the grave digger and asks him, whose grave is this, Sirrah? And the grave digger responds, mine, sir. Here we discover that Hamlet's not the only master of words as cunning deflection. The simple grave digger can play that game too. The grave diggers laying claim to the grave sets the stage for the whole scene, which makes us realize that the grave digger is indeed, in one sense, digging his own grave, that we're all digging our own graves, and therein lies a universal truth. This reminder of what we have in common comes to us even though the grave digger has sidetracked the answer to Hamlet's question about the particular person who has died, the specific individual. Who exactly is to be married, buried in that grave? We know, of course, what Hamlet doesn't know, that it's Ophelia that is to be buried in that grave. Ophelia, the woman we believe Hamlet loves and whose death he may have indirectly caused. And yet, if anything, this delay in Hamlet's understanding of his particular loss intensifies our vicarious emotional horror. We feel more of Hamlet's singular grief because of this misunderstanding, this verbal delay. Through its very indirection, our pain is increased. The conversation between Hamlet and the gravedigger continues on with a similar opacity. What man dost thou dig it for, Hamlet asks, still very anxious to know who, who, who has died. And the gravedigger responds, for no man, sir. Ophelia is to be buried in that grave, but the grave digger says what is also true, but much less revealing for no man, sir. Again here, there's total miscommunication, and yet we take from it, and even Hamlet, in all his despair and confusion, eventually takes from it a universal truth. No matter who you are, what choices you make in life, the end is the same. And so by indirection in Hamlet, we find directions out. In this case, by verbal miscommunication, we find ourselves in communion with all of humanity. <laughs>
And by the way, I owe much of the inspiration for talking about this scene in Hamlet to one of my current sophomore students, Brian Trace. Conversation in this case, conversation initiated by a student, enlarges the language of every participant and helps him or her cross the threshold between inner worlds. But the graveyard scene in Hamlet goes beyond the idea that the bell is tolling for all of us. We come closer in this scene, not just to our common fate, but also to the personal loss of another human being. Something inescapably private and individual, some inkling of Hamlet's particular grief, has been opened up to the emotional understanding of the audience. And because it is Shakespeare, his audiences and readers are legion, generation after generation, all feeling the stab of Hamlet's loss even before he knows it himself. Whoops. Another work that explores the topic of language and its inadequacies very much in the context of the loneliness of the individual soul is Virginia Woolf's 1927 novel, To the Lighthouse. In that novel, the inexpressibility of life's deepest experiences is a major theme, which is pretty ironic when you think about it. It's a novel about inexpressibility. Perhaps not incidentally, it is also a novel about coming to terms with grief. Most of the most important scenes in the novel happen in total silence, with one character or another thinking to him or herself that nothing could be said. Nothing need be said. Why, you might ask, would Wolf write a novel about what cannot be said? I think it's probably an attempt on her part to reconcile what cannot be said with the need to say it. Wolf explores this problem through the character of Lily Briscoe, a guest of the Ramsey family and a painter who struggles throughout the novel to capture the essence of what she sees in her art. She feels that she has achieved something on the last page of the novel as she puts down her brush, recognizing that she has had her vision. As she finishes her painting, Wolf finishes her novel, and thus we know that in some way Lily stands in for Virginia Woolf, who was also struggling to express her vision in her art. We know that Woolf based her novel on her own family, Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey standing in for her parents, Leslie and Julia Stephen. By the time Wolf wrote to the lighthouse, her mother had died, just as Mrs. Ramsey dies during the course of the novel. So we have to imagine that the writer slash daughter was struggling to say something about her mother, just as Lily in her painting was struggling to represent Mrs. Ramsey as she really was. What was the spirit in her, Lily wonders, as she tries to capture this beloved, beloved matriarch, Mrs. Ramsey, and paint. The essential thing by which, had you found a crumpled glove in the corner of a sofa, you would have known it would, from its twisted finger, hers indisputably. Here, of course, is the struggle to commune with another solitary soul. As Lily looks at Mrs. Ramsey bending over her book, she reflects that she's the loveliest of people, but also quite different from the shape sitting there. Her essential spirit is not the same as her outer form. But why different and how different, Lily asks herself, quote, scraping her palette of all those mounds of blue and green which seem to her like clods with no life in them now. Yet she vowed she would inspire them, force them to move, flow, do her bidding tomorrow. Now think about this. She's trying to paint not the outward form of Mrs. Ramsey, but her inner being. How do you do that? How do you do that with visual art? How do you even do that with words? I, I'm sure that all of us have felt at one time or another, maybe currently now when everybody's writing papers, the, some version of the kind of lifelessness that Lily felt in the clods of paint, the impossibility of expression, which is always, in the words of T.S. Eliot, arrayed on the inarticulate, with shabby equipment always deteriorating in the general mess of imprecision of feeling. We can only imagine that the novelist, like her character, is struggling with the same problem, 
how to force her materials, that is words, verbal images, to express the essential spirit of her mother. How to arrive at the thing itself, even to articulate a fraction of her mother's being and the world she had created for her children and her friends. Perhaps most important of all, how to bring the dead back to life. The novelist expresses this struggle through Lily's effort to know and to paint Mrs. Ramsey. Lily imagined, the book goes on, quote, how in the chambers of the mind and heart of the woman who was physically touching her were stood like the treasures in the tombs of kings, tablets bearing sacred inscriptions, which if one could spell them out would teach one everything, but they would never be offered openly, never made public, unquote. And then the passage continues, having expressed the hidden treasures within Mrs. Ramsey never to be made public. The narrator suggests about Lily that it was not knowledge but unity Lily desired, not inscriptions on tablets, nothing that could be written in any language known to men, but intimacy itself, which is knowledge. This is one of many moments in that novel that makes reference to what cannot be spoken and cannot be written. This inaccessibility is the more poignant as we experience one woman who happens to be an artist struggle to cross that uncrossable threshold between one soul and another. And Wolf takes care that we know the impossibility of this crossing. Our apparitions, Mrs. Ramsey thinks, quote, the things you know us by are simply childish. Beneath it, it is all dark, it is all spreading, it is unfathomably deep. But now and again, we rise to the surface and that is what you see us by. Think about this. We're all then ghosts to one another with little fragments bobbing up that we're known by. But beneath it, we're darkly and deeply mysterious in our separate depths. This point is made explicitly in the novel after 10 years have passed and Mrs. Ramsey has died. Still, Lily struggles with her memory and her grief and her need to say something about it. And she, quote, and she wanted to say not one thing but everything. Little words that broke up the thought and dismembered it said nothing about life, about death, about Mrs. Ramsey. No, she thought, one could say nothing to nobody. The urgency of the moment always missed its mark. Words fluttered sideways and struck the object inches too low." Unquote. Clods of paint are lifeless. Words flutter sideways. With this passage from To the Lighthouse, I'm back to where I began, to the absolute incapacity of words to plumb the depths of individual experience even of one single soul. In this case, the struggle is intensified by grief, which underscores the inaccessibility of the loved one. And yet, and yet the novel is expressing exactly that inaccessibility, pointing to some essence beneath the surface that cannot be captured. And in that very saying, it brings us closer to understanding the task before us. The awareness of the unplumbed basin of reality, even of one single individual, brings us closer together. And we glimpse for a moment the miracle of capturing a, even a fragment of what can be known. After all, we understand reality through language, however imprecise, insofar as reality can be understood at all. With all its limitations, language is the connective tissue that brings us together and to some understanding of the other. The novel is far greater for looking unblinkingly at that challenge. Quote, yet it would be hung in the attics, Lily thought about her painting. It would be rolled up and flung under a sofa. Yet even so, even of a picture like that, it was true. One might say, even of this scrawl, not of the actual picture, perhaps, but of what it attempted, that it remained forever. The attempt, the attempt represented by words and by art to get beyond the limitations that can never fully be got beyond is what matters. <laughs>
Words and paint gesture beyond themselves to what can never be fully expressed, but they can bring us closer. They can bring us closer to what cannot be said, and they can be, bring us closer to each other. The same realization exactly came to me in the outpouring of messages and letters when my husband died. It was the attempt represented by those words that made all the difference. The attempt to express the inexpressible lies at the heart of the human community, of our shared life together. At the moment of his death, a hole opened up in the universe, and everybody tried to fill it, mostly with words. The fabric could not be mended, but it helped tremendously that they tried. It, it must be said here that it's almost laughable to suggest that a masterpiece like To the Lighthouse is an attempt only. But that is what the novel seems to be saying. We can only be grateful for attempts such as these. We can only be grateful for a work of literature that looks unblinkingly at human finitude and in so doing actually helps to triumph over it. In the middle section of the novel called Time Passes, time is presented as the destructive force of nature wiping out every trace of human life and human achievement. And yet the novel withstands time's ravages by the very act of depicting them. Even more to the point, some 10 years after the death of Mrs. Ramsey, we actually experience her living on in others, changing their lives and inspiring Lily's art. Destruction and loss may be inevitable, but what prevails finally is the endurance of the human spirit and its expression through language. And as surely as Mrs. Ramsey lives on in those who loved her, and I should add, in the minds and hearts of countless read readers of that novel, generation after generation, Julia Stephen lives on in her daughter Virginia's great novel. So it is with countless generations of the dead whom we honor with words. Time destroys everything, but through words or the other arts, what has been lost lives on. It is by this means that we are granted access, however painfully circumscribed, to the inner lives of others, living or dead. Quote, there might be lovers, Lily thinks, referring to artists like herself who make some effort to depict what they experience, whose gift it was to choose out the elements of things and put them together, and so giving them a wholeness not theirs in life, make of some scene or meeting of people all now gone and separate, one of those globed, compacted things over which thought lingers and love plays. That just might be the greatest possible description of what art can be, whether verbal or visual. I will read it again. There might be lovers whose gift it was to choose out the elements of things and place them together and so giving them a wholeness not theirs in life make of some scene or meeting of people all now gone and separate, one of those globed, compacted things over which thought lingers and love plays. Note especially the contrast between people all now gone and separate and the description of a creative act as making something whole, a globed, compacted thing. Such unifying efforts are treasures these gifts of representation. They are acts of love. If they can conjure up a meeting of people now gone and separate, even if that image gives them a wholeness not theirs in life, what is created, what is expressed, becomes an object of thought and love. Language then, for all its missteps, is an act of love that generates more thought and more love. Even if it does not represent reality directly or completely, even if in some sense it creates something not entirely real, nonetheless its effects are real, including its capacity to breach the solitude of the individual soul. What is more, because each effort at expressing the inexpressible is an attempt only, we need to keep trying. That is what art is, that is what words of sympathy are, and that is what teaching is all lie at the heart of the human community. Now, some of you may have guessed by now that I'm responding in these remarks 
to contemporary currents of thought on the topic of language, especially post-structuralist and deconstructive thinking. This strain of theory emphasizes the incapacity of language to represent reality directly, underscoring it's the fact that it refers to itself and not the world, and the fact that it's incomplete. The same body of material exposes the limitations of all our systems of thought, all rational efforts to attain some certainty about the world. I myself have learned a great deal from these theories, especially from Jacques Derrida, who's most closely associated with deconstruction. Exposure to his thinking humbles one's assumptions of any kind of mastery, which is not a bad thing. It promotes humility over the violence of certainty. But I'm persuaded that the pendulum has swung too far, maybe much too far. In our acute awareness of language's limitations, we are in danger of losing sight of its inestimable value. The creations of language represent our shared and priceless heritage. They form the very basis of the humane disciplines, those disciplines that attempt to say in literature and in the other arts, in theology and philosophy, what humanity can and cannot achieve and what binds us together. And yet this is a time when the humanities are in danger, threatened from without by economic pressures to promote what has obvious practical utility in the marketplace or to measure output. They are also threatened from within. Inside the academy, there's a kind of loss of confidence in the lip service paid to the humane disciplines and perhaps in what they can actually achieve. And that loss has been accompanied by a turning inward to increasingly rarefied forms of discourse. In this environment, it is vitally important to remember what the humanities actually represent. As I have tried to suggest, they constitute the warp and weft of the human community. Now, I began by talking about language as a threshold and a bridge between the particular and the universal. And I just want to give one nonverbal example to, to, to demonstrate that I, when I say language speaks, I'm not simply speaking of words. And that nonverbal example, I imagine, is familiar to many of you. It's the Vietnam War, War Memorial in Washington, DC. That gash of black marble halfway underground and halfway above ground with the innumerable names of the dead in Vietnam. And probably you know this, but that, that monument was designed by Maya Lin when she was a senior in college. It was when she was a senior in college that she submitted it to a national competition and won. She had a vision of how to reconcile individual loss with that of the collective. She did so by constructing this simple wall, cutting into the ground itself, that lists all the names of the dead. And so when you go to visit the Vietnam Memorial, as I did a couple of weeks ago, there are always people just transfixed by one name, doing a rubbing of that name, taking photographs of that name, just standing there with one name, communing with what they lost as a family. And yet, at the same time, all those names are united into something that is part of our heritage as a whole. This is one of the ways that the art speaks, that arts, that art speaks to us, whether or not art speaks with words. I'd like to end by suggesting that we ought to see language not as a self-contained and hopelessly inadequate system for understanding the world, but as what the psychoanalytic thinker Donald Winnicott called a transitional object. Winnicott wrote a famous essay in 1951 about such transitional objects. The term he used to describe the infant's first, quote, not me possession, that is the blanket or the teddy bear or whatever object the child chooses to select. Now bear with me, you must be wondering, what does a teddy bear have to do with words? But the key, the key idea here is transitional. These objects, Winnicott argued, represent the child's first glimpse of otherness, 
They form an essential link between child and the world. The child does not see her teddy bear as part of herself, nor does she fully recognize it as belonging to external reality either. It's neither outside her control, like the loved but absent caregiver, nor under her full control, like something wholly imaginary. By endowing these objects with meaning, the child is creating what he or she needs, the love of another, when in fact that bond is threatened by the recognition that her, the mother or the other loved one comes and goes. Love and need, then, lead to the child's first act of imagination. This is the domain of the illusory, existing somewhere between subjective and objective worlds, softening the infant's journey from one to the other. This intermediate area, wrote Winnicott, constitutes the germ of the arts and of religion, a hybrid zone that eases the ongoing strain that all people experience in relating inner and outer reality. The creations of language then, and by extension those of all the arts, I would like to suggest, are like these transitional objects. They emerge from an in-between space, between subjectivity and objectivity, self and other. Forged by the bonds of love and need that bind people together, they prompt even the youngest among us to acts of imagination and creativity that reach across the gulf between solitary souls. It is worth remembering then that every attempt at genuine communication from the simplest words of kindness to the language of Shakespeare, strings a footbridge, footbridge across the abyss of our aloneness. All such attempts are truly acts of love. Thank you.